Hi everybody, welcome back. Thank you for joining me today. We have a really beautiful and expansive topic to talk about and that is cultural appropriation. So let's get started. So the term cultural appropriation is something that I have heard of several times in the past and is something that has been brought up in courses I have taken when I have been doing my training in my spiritual coaching or healing practices and it's also something that came up when I was recently reading Me and White Supremacy by Leila F. Saad and I finally got my hands on a copy of this book. I highly recommend that you read it or listen to it as an audiobook and I will be doing a review in depth talking about this book shortly. So I think the best thing to do is to start by defining what cultural appropriation is. There are so many different authors and speakers and public... what are they called? <laughs> I can't think of the word, hang on. Oh, public figures. And public figures out there who have defined this or talked about cultural appropriation. So I'm just going to share a really succinct definition that I am using as an interpretation through what I have learnt from all the different places I have learnt about cultural appropriation. However, I will see if I can link some things in the description box so that you can go and look up the definitions yourself. So essentially, cultural appropriation is the misuse through the adoption or the adaptation or the absorption of another culture's practices rituals, uh, it, can, it can be so many different things and we'll look into all the different aspects but it's essentially when one culture adopts something that belongs to another culture and basically claims it as their own, absorbs it as their own and doesn't necessarily stay true to where it came from, it doesn't share its origin, its roots and quite often it changes it to what suits that culture as opposed to what suited the culture it came from. Now this is a massive topic and I want to today discuss what it is and also share an interesting perspective which some of you may agree with, some of you may never have thought of and some of you may completely disagree with. So I will carry a trigger warning with this video because what I'm sharing is my personal opinion. If you don't agree that's okay and I'm still learning and I just want to kind of share this because it's a really interesting topic to me and it's definitely something that I probably will make a couple of videos on so if there's something that I don't put in this video and you think wait Marilise missed this or she missed that don't worry I will probably come back to this topic definitely again within the next few months but I imagine over the next few years as I expand on my research and as I really step into what I'm doing I imagine I will talk about this again and again and probably again so I will always be welcomed to hearing your thoughts and opinions on these things but if it differs that's okay just please remember to come from that space of the heart and of love and if you feel yourself reacting in a triggered way then just stop for a moment and ask is this coming from a space of love or is it coming from a space of the ego? And if it's coming from the ego, wait until it's from a space of love. And if you don't know what the ego is, see me afterwards. <laughs> okay, so let's just give some examples of cultural appropriation. I've got a list on my phone that I wrote that I made as a note for this video because I just think it's such an important topic. So I think cultural appropriation actually shows up quite a lot in the spiritual world. However, I'm going to start with the more let's call it physical, material, mundane, everyday world because that's where all of us start off when we're born into this life, right? So I think the first space that we can all agree has been culturally appropriated is music. 100% black music has really been the root and the origin of so much to do with the music industry and the way we shape and put music out into the world and how it sounds and what it has a rhythm of etc. That is an area that is really culturally appropriated and I really recommend you to do your own research on this. Look at the music genre that you're interested in and really research where that came from. Was it from a black community or a black area or a black person or was it adapted from that? and in which case has it been culturally appropriated? Do you perhaps need to go back to where it originally came from and really appreciate that culture as opposed to appropriating it? 
Another area is hair. This is for women and men, but I just wanna share a story with you, which is from my childhood. And when I was around eight or nine years old, uh, one of the girls I was at school with went on holiday to Barbados. And when she came back, she had her hair in braids with the beads at the end. And I can remember thinking, why has she done that? That's not something that we ever would see normally on a white girl. And I just remember feeling a little bit uncomfortable would be the best term to use. I was only eight or nine. I wasn't aware of cultural appropriation. I wasn't aware of lots of different things I'm now aware of. However, even I knew at that age, it was perhaps not culturally appropriate for her to have that. And I know that you could argue that perhaps that happened because of tourism and in Barbados that was something a way of people making money however I just think there's other ways to support local cultures as opposed to appropriating from them is it gonna call record yeah but we all know that hair has definitely been culturally appropriated from black women and women of color we can also talk about for example hair extensions is it appropriate to have hair extensions of real hair from women of colour or black women? I don't really know. I can't be the judge of that for you because it's a very individual thing in some ways and you need to understand what you can sit with, what you feel comfortable with. But looking at the roots of where things that you're interested in come from is a really good way to start. So for example, when it comes to clothing and fashion, so many different aspects of fashion have been culturally appropriated. And I really recommend that you do some research into this, especially if you have a particular fashion house or a particular style or brand that you like to wear. But just for an example, bucket hats, for example, would have been worn by the black community. It's very much ingrained in black culture. Headwear is really important. And that's something that's now filtering out and just becoming this great big fashion statement. However, it's just being absorbed as if it came from the fashion house. It's not actually being shared where it came from, what its roots are, how it connects to the culture it originally came from. And that's where the appropriation happens in the not identifying and just absorbing it as if it's your own. So another area where cultural appropriation has been coming through more and more recently is actually in the exercise world. I have definitely noticed a trend where white women or lighter skinned women are attempting to grow their booty and get the kind of curves and pert booty that usually a black woman would have. Something I would like to add as I'm editing is that I'm aware that the trend for growing your booty can definitely be connected to the Kardashians and to their body shape, but I would like to add that, of course, where does that originate from? What is the reason for that emulation and bringing through that more feminine black physique as opposed to what was perhaps more natural for them? More often than not, white women tend to have slightly smaller bums and in recent years, it's become very popular to have a big booty. And I really think that's because we're starting to recognize black beauty in the Western world, which is so long overdue. However, instead of just saying, look how amazing those black women are, we have absorbed the way that black women are naturally shaped and been like, well, immediately I must have a really pert round booty to be attractive. And I really find this a bit weird, to be completely honest. No offense if, you know, this is something that you're working towards. If you genuinely just want to have a good toned pert shape to your whole body, that's cool. But why are you growing your booty or your bum? Like really think about that. Is it because it's become fashionable? Why has it become fashionable? Because it's been appropriated from black women and their natural, beautiful physique, that's why. And I can remember when I signed up to the gym, I used to go to years ago, and the inductor said to me, oh, I guess you're gonna to want to know all the machines to help you get a really big bum. And I was like, no, <laughs> I'm okay that I am a flat, small, bummed girl. I'll just wait for that to be in fashion. It's fine, I really don't mind. Like hats off to the women who are naturally that shape. And there are some white women who naturally have very beautifully pert bottoms. But if you have a flatter or a smaller bum, 
doesn't make you any less beautiful, but I think we really need to be celebrating black women's bodies, not trying to emulate or copy them. That's just something I really have noticed and I feel kind of uncomfortable about. So I definitely wanted to share that with you just to kind of hopefully um, share a perspective that you might not have thought of before when it comes to the exercise world. So another aspect is language. I've definitely noticed, and I'm sure you have too, not just in music, but in just everyday terms, people are starting to use this kind of language black people would in their culture as, it, as their own. So for example, saying boy bye, or saying mm -hmm, sister, or yes girl. That is so not a white thing to do. And again, it's fantastic to celebrate black culture. It's fantastic to normalize it rather than segregate it or push it to one side. However, if it isn't part of your culture, should you really be doing it? Or if you are, are you at least saying where something is coming from? I don't know, I feel really uncomfortable when I see or I experience white women or white passing women talking in a way that a black woman would because it's just not who you are. Why are you trying to be somebody or not? Why are you not just allowing black women to do that? And I do think maybe in some ways um, reality TV shows haven't helped because we watch reality TV and it becomes almost like, wow, I'd love to be like that. That's so cool. If I could emulate and copy that, I'd be as cool as them. I'd be as good looking as them. That's kind of like role models, if you like. And is that the best role model? Is that the most educated role model to have? I don't know, I can't answer that for you. You have to look in your heart and see the answer to that. But I do feel like, I don't even feel comfortable using an emoji that is connected to black language, for example. That it's just, I just think it's kind of, it's a bit wrong. I can't say that any better. <laughs> I don't know, I don't want to sound awful, but yeah, it's just, be true to who you are as opposed to trying to copy or emulate or absorb something that doesn't actually belong to you. Have those boundaries energetically, spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. It's important. You are you for a reason. Enjoy that. Celebrate that. You know, share who you are. Don't try and be something else that you're not just because it's popular in modern culture. And I just want to share that in Me and White Supremacy, Layla actually says that linguistic styles are culturally appropriated. The appropriation of AAVE by non-black people. So that's basically what I'm talking about there. Love this book. Another area where I think we have started to culturally appropriate is actually makeup and the idea of having bigger lips. Again, it's more natural to stick with your lip shape, your lip size. I don't know who it was who started the trend where you suck a glass or a bottle to make your lips bigger. You don't need to do that. You don't need to pencil around the outside to make it look bigger. Just love the body and the lips that you have. The whole point of this self-love movement is that you really love yourself, not just physically or not just slightly emotionally, but everything like your roots, where you came from, your ancestors, your heritage, what you truly look like in the here and now. Celebrate that, love that, be in that space and just share that with the world. That's what the world needs, not people copying or emulating something that isn't theirs or doesn't really resonate or belong to them. Oh my god, my hips. Also, another area where cultural appropriation often takes place is on the dance floor, or sometimes not even on the dance floor, but through twerking. This is definitely something that is culturally appropriated and is something that needs to be respected and honoured from where it came and what it's actually connected to and why it's practised within black and African culture. It's definitely not something that I've ever heard of being in white culture before. So again, that is something that has really been culturally appropriated recently. So just looking again at, is that really appropriate for you to be connecting to that and practicing that? Okay, let's get into the spiritual side of cultural appropriation, which is such a huge topic. As I say, I probably will come back to this. Just checking my timer and I I forgot to turn it on, <laughs> so I have no, long, I, no idea how long I've been talking. How we have culturally appropriated spiritually. Wow, what a big topic. There's so, so much I could say. I'm gonna pick just two things to talk about where we've culturally appropriated. The first thing I wanna share is cacao ceremonies. Now this has become really big in women's circles and women teaching other women or leading other women. And it is a beautiful ceremony. I have recently taken part in an online cacao ceremony as part of a course that I've been doing. And 
I ordered some cacao. I was just going to do um, a hot chocolate and then I thought to myself, actually, this is something that I need to do properly and I need to honour it. You know, if I'm going to do it, I need to do it properly as opposed to just half-assing it. That's not really the right thing and I have no intention of carrying it on beyond the packet that I own um, because it's just not part of my culture. If there's something similar in my culture, by all means, I will connect with that. However, it's not part of my culture. So it's a beautiful thing. I have seen it really promoted on social media quite a lot and it's fantastic to become aware of other cultures, beautiful rituals that they have. However, just be aware if you're just using it for personal reasons, I feel like that's okay. But if you're starting to teach other people about it, and it's not from your culture, just be aware, is that culturally appropriate for you to do that? So it's not something that I would include in my women's circles unless I brought in a guest speaker to share a cacao ceremony from their culture specifically. And that's where you can support black business owners and BIPOC business owners by bringing them in as the guest speaker. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know everything. Oh my God, this thing keeps cutting out. Yeah, you don't have to have all of the answers to everything spiritual. The whole point of other people being in the world is that they can teach and share these, this knowledge too. So do tap into that, do honor that and respect that. So I'm not saying this to make you feel like a bad person if you enjoy cacao. By all means, drink it if it feels culturally appropriate and if it's something that you're just practicing on your own because you can support BIPOC by buying cacao from them, for example. However, if you're going to be sharing it with other people on social media or if you're going to be sharing it in women's circles, I do just invite you to really look at who you can bring in as a guest speaker to share that. So the second area of spirituality I want to share that has been culturally appropriated and it's the most obvious one is yoga. I'm sure many of you have thought of this and are aware of this but obviously it is originally from India and it has been brought over to the West and when you think of yoga now you just think of like skinny blonde white yoga mums you know going to the yoga class and then going home and having a green juice and I don't want to stereotype but that is what you tend to think of you don't tend to think of you know Buddhists or Sikhs who would have practiced it in a completely different way as well it's not actually that much about the physicality of it it's about the spiritual and mental and emotional aspect of it um, which has been adopted and adapted and that's why it's culturally appropriated because even though we're all aware of the roots of yoga it's not really taught i've never been to a yoga class where somebody has said i'm just going to briefly share the roots of yoga because obviously it doesn't come from my culture and again that's just it's just a small tweak that we need to make in that sense and there's no reason that you can't continue to practice yoga but it's just if you're going to be doing it and it's not from your heritage your culture just Admitting that, acknowledging that, including that, identifying that, that's what's important. So I told you that this was going to be <laughs> a triggering video, Ooh. <laughs> but just sit with it for a bit. I'm not saying any of this to attack you or make you feel bad or to purposefully trigger you. I'm just saying it to make you think, oh wait, am I actually putting on makeup in a way that isn't connected to my heritage? For example, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Egypt and so many spiritual children are. Let's be completely honest, like Egypt is the golden era. And I used to do my makeup like Cleopatra from the films or I used to actually try and do the Eye of Horus around my eye with eyeliner. And I was just, I loved Egypt, I still do. I think it's the most incredible historical time period ever. And I mean, I love so many different time periods in history, don't get me wrong, I'm a bit of a geek but Egypt has my heart. However, I don't have any heritage or ancestry in that. So I have to be very mindful when I'm doing that, that actually is that appropriate for me to do that? And you know what? I feel like that brings me really nicely to the second half of this video, which is I wanna share the flip side of this. And this is definitely more of a spiritual perspective. And again, it might be controversial to you, or you might just think, yeah, of course, I thought of that before. But one question I want to pose to you, and I'm not saying I have the answer, but what role do past lives play in cultural appropriation? So if you're somebody who has a very strong affinity to a particular time in history or a particular culture, 
how do you incorporate that into your spirituality without it being cultural appropriation? And I, I don't have the answer to this question. If you do, please stick that in the comments below. I know full well that you can train and really honor the traditions to do with that particular culture and really honor that and really bring that in when you're sharing it with other people. I understand and respect that a lot. However, if you have a really strong affinity through past lives to another culture, how do you bring that in? And I'm saying that partly <laughs> answers on a postcard for myself. As I say, I have a very strong affinity to Egypt. I've been through past life regressions. I've seen myself in a couple of lifetimes there. And I've also had Akashic Record readings where I've been told about lifetimes I've had there. And I just knew as a child, everything I ever did, every book I read, every film that I love watching was very much connected to Egypt. I even wrote a book, a short story, <laughs> about Egypt and about a woman who went to find um, a sacred amulet. It was very cliche, but I just love ancient Egyptian culture and it's literally my dream to go there. And I had actually, well, I was just about to book to go on a retreat there. And unfortunately, obviously with COVID-19, it's all been canceled. So not meant to go right now, that's fine. I can surrender to that and recognize I'll get to go when I when I meant to. But how do I incorporate that into my spirituality? Do I bring that in through practicing at home in my own space and I'm not doing it to culturally appropriate or absorb it or take it on as my own, but just to honor that aspect of my ancient soul? Or is that still a form of a cultural appropriation and I should just respect it, love it from afar? It's a great question and I'm glad that I can use myself and as an example. And I will share that my heritage, my roots, my DNA is mostly Celtic, so Irish, Welsh, British or English, and French and Basque. That's where my heritage, my DNA, for this lifetime though, let me add that in, for this lifetime. That's why I wanna ask this question because this is this is the crux, right? So I grew up in a single parent household with my mom. My mom is a quarter French, quarter Basque. So the French influence from her French mother was very strong. So I've had a very strong French influence. I feel definitely very connected to that aspect of myself, but I've never felt connected to the other side of myself from my father's side. That's because I've never met him. I don't know him, so I don't have, that experience to connect with it in a way. And I just don't feel any connection to my Celtic roots and to the Celtic beliefs and religions or goddesses and gods. And I really want to, you know, I've bought the deck that I shared with you in the unboxing. I've bought a book about it. I've read about things and researched things, but I just, when I look at the goddesses from Celtic traditions, I don't feel anything in my body. When I look at Hathor, when I look at Sekhmet, when I look at Isis, I feel a reaction of love and connection in my body. Again, that could just be because I've not had the influence from my father to tell me about that side of myself, to connect me to that side of myself. And I'm definitely trying to get into that side because I don't want to culturally appropriate at all. Like, I'm such a serious person, <laughs> in case you couldn't tell from my serious videos, that I take spirituality very seriously. I see it as very sacred, something I need to respect and honor. I'm the same with my clients. I take it seriously. When I'm working with a client, to me, ensuring that the space is sacred and it's safe and it really is of their highest good is the most important thing to me. Oh, I take that seriously, which is so funny because like in normal life, I'm not a very serious person. So <laughs> on these videos, I come across as like really serious and formal, but actually when you get to know me in person, you're like, oh, she's a bit of a goof. So anyway, going back to my story. So I'm trying to get back into that side of myself, look into it, research it, form a connection with those gods and goddesses. But where is the boundary? And that's what I want to ask you. And I might have the answer myself in a couple of weeks, months, years, whatever. I don't know. That's why I'll probably make more than one video about cultural appropriation because it's just such a big topic. But how do we bring past lives in? Is it just through practicing at home or practicing it? I feel like it's when you practice it with other people or when you share it with other people that it becomes appropriation. And also, how does it connect to cultural appreciation? I don't know, it's a fascinating topic. Like, I, I love it. And when I was reading the book, I was just thinking, wow, this is just such a big topic. And of course, there's only so much that Leila can put in her book. But I definitely will be doing more and more research 
and as I say I've bought some books to connect to my Celtic side and learn about the goddesses and gods and really try and connect with them on an energetic level so yeah you might see me in the next video and I'm like guys totally connected to Bloodwed or to Anne Rod or Bran or Bran Wen you know um I would love that timer okay I've definitely been talking for more than 10 minutes <laughs> I can't wait to edit this. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me today for this video. As I said, it's a huge topic. There's so much to look to. Being culturally appropriate is important. Honoring your past lives and who your soul is is important. And finding a way to marry and blend those two that serves as opposed to emulating or absorbing in an inappropriate way is really important. So I feel like starting with the kind of more physical things I mentioned like hair, makeup, clothing and music and exercise, that's a really good way to start looking at are you culturally appropriating? And I really recommend the questions that Leila has for the journal prompts for the day about cultural appropriation because it just really made me think it was just, yeah, it was just amazing. It's such a good book. I can't wait to do a review on this actually. Thank you so much for watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in next week's video.